Hey everybody, I'm here with the biggest lion of all, Andrew Harvey. Um, let me just read a little bit about Andrew Harvey. Andrew is one of the world's most honored mystics and spiritual teachers and a leading translator of Rumi and Kabir, history's most renowned mystical poets. An Oxford trained religious scholar and founder of the Institute for Sacred Activism, He's the author of more than 40 books and maintains an active teaching schedule both in the US and abroad. He lives in Oak Park, Illinois. Uh, I should also mention he's my friend. Um, he has been a- I'm your brother, I'm not your friend. He's been a very grounded and supportive brother, particularly for me during the last somewhat difficult period. Um, I published his book, uh, evolutionary love relationships that he wrote with Chris Sade that I highly recommend. I think it's 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 more and more important and necessary to read this book all the time, particularly in the direction that the culture is going. Um, and Andrew's work can be found at andrewharvey.net as well as in social media. So your new book, In Golden Mint, A Year with Kabir, 366 Timeless Poems. It's a really beautiful book. I really, really love the cover. Um, I love the cover. Those were three naughty yogis sitting on a stoop outside the hotel that I was living in, which is a crumbling, crazy hotel. And they were so kabir, so joyful, so radical, such rascals that I, I went up to them and I said, can I photograph you? And they said, oh, yes, we'll bless you. And there they are forever on the front. I'm so happy. Was this in Benares or where was this? Yes, Benares, my favorite place on earth, the place in which Kabir lived his whole life until the end. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. So, so tell us about Kabir. Who is Kabir? Who was Kabir? And why should Kabir matter to us? Hmm. Kabir is India's greatest mystical poet. Now, just think about what I've just said. India's greatest mystical poet. The greatest poet of a 3,000-year-old sacred tradition, perhaps the most vibrant and radiant and multi-textured sacred tradition on the planet, still, through all the madness, alive. Kabir, for me, is the equivalent to mystical poetry of what Bach is to music. In fact, the Everest, by which all other poets are judged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every composer turns to Bach and just faints away at the brilliance and madness and greatness and order of that sublime music and knows that in Bach there is the unreachable standard of final excellence. That's what Kabir is for me and for so many other people. He was born probably in 1440. That's the latest agreement of the scholars. Before they said he was born in 1398. But that means that when he died, which we do know the date of 1518, he would have been 120, which is highly unlikely. Mm. So he was born in 1440 in what was then called Benares, which is now called Varanasi. And Benares is the holiest city in India. It is a city that is dedicated to Shiva. Shiva is meant to live there. And every Hindu wants to die in Benares because it said that if you die in Benares, Shiva personally gives you liberation. So all the rascals and the politicians and the corrupt pedophiles long to be burned in Benares because they think when I'm burning, Shiva will turn up and liberate me. He wasn't a Hindu, however, and this is wildly important. He was born a poor weaver in a poor weaver's family, a Muslim family, mm. very, very marginalized. And that's important because Kabir's poetry is the most radical revolutionary poetry of any mystic that we've ever been given. And I believe it could only have been written by someone who really had the fangs of poverty sunken in his neck and knew mm -hmm. as a blue collar guy what 
people really, really go through. Sometime towards the beginning of his 20s, he woke up. I mean, not just woke up and had an odd experience, but woke up completely to a complete embodied divine realization. You know, one of the many reasons I love you, Jeff, is because you coined the term in realment, which I think is fabulous. Kabir is the emperor of in realment. He was born in his early 20s into a fully divine, fully human incarnation in which he realized his oneness with the transcendent in heart, mind, soul, and body, and this is mm. crucial. Well, when he woke up, he realized that Benares was just a costume party of charlatans, mm. and that the Hindus were crazy in their caste system and in their rituals and ceremonies and mantras and shmantras, and the Muslims <laughs> were crazy because they screamed from the top of minarets when God could quietly hear you if you're just sitting on your porch speaking to God and in the killing of goats and in the incredibly stupid claim that only Islam could possibly lead to divine liberation. Mm. And being Kabir, being this gutsy blue collar guy, totally realized he just said what he thought. He said to all the Hindu teachers, you're full of it. You're crazy. You're playing stupid, cheating, ridiculous games. You're gulling the people. Stop it. And he said to the, all the Muslims and all the Sufi sheikhs, he said, you're out of your effing minds. And that's the kind of language he used. And that did not make him, as you can imagine, popular. He became the most dangerous person in Benares, all the more dangerous because he refused to give up his craft of being a poor weaver. He earned his own cash. He had a wife and two kids. He lived as a householder. And he said, you don't be, need to be in a monastery. You don't need to have saffron robes. You don't need to have these fancy Muslim caps. You just need to be in direct connection, which is given to you as an original blessing by the eternal one, because you are the child of God right now. So get rid of the religions, get rid of all the fancy rituals, get rid of the prayers, get rid of believing that when you dunk in the Ganges, you get rid of your sins. If it was that easy, <laughs> you won't be enlightened. And get down with the direct connection and do one practice and one practice only, the saying of the divine name. That's what got me to realization, and it will get you. And they all fell about because they couldn't shut him up. Because the ordinary people, the cigarette sellers and the people who burned the dead and the guys who were porters, they got him like a rash. They knew he was one of them. They knew he was their guy telling them what none of the Sanskrit wallers or the people who had to speak in Arabic only to the elite were talking about because he did his poems, which he sang on his porch and had were taken down by his buddies. He gave his poems in street Hindi. He was the first mystical poet of India, not to play with any of the fancy languages, but to speak guy to guy man to woman, directly, nakedly, simply out of his own blazing realization. So all the authorities hated him, but all the poor people protected him. And then I'll tell you one story. I'll tell you two stories which get to the essence of who he was. And he was a rascal. He just kicked it. He was the most fearless person who ever lived. Gabriel, he makes, sometimes when I read him, I feel, my God, I'm a little teensy-weensy wimp. And I, I've been pretty butch in my life, I mean, in a certain way. And <laughs> I have really told truth to power, but n nobody has ever told truth to power like he did. One day... The king heard that there was this guy who'd become the chief total realization who was a poor weaver and was pissing off all the authorities. So of course, naturally, he was intrigued. So he invited Kabir to dinner alone. So Kabir went, dressed in his ordinary work clothes, no fancy stuff. And he said, hi, king. 
And the king said, please sit down. I've heard so much about you. And I would like to give you this bag of gold. And Kabir said, I don't need your gold. You need it. You live this fancy life. And I understand that you have a role. You keep your gold. And I'll keep my weaving. And I'll keep the money I make from my weaving. But we'll have a chat. And the king, being a real person, had never heard any spiritual teacher refuse gold. So he hugged Kabir and he said, oh, my God, finally, a real person. Let's have a talk. And they talked and talked all night. And the king the next day said, nobody touches this man. You just let him be. Whatever he says, follow it. This is the real enchilada. And of course, that shut them up so they couldn't kill him or do any of the other things they wanted to do to him. Yes. So when it came for him to die, he did something extremely naughty. He was very, very naughty throughout his life, but this was particularly naughty because the myth around Benares, why Benares is not just the holiest city, but also the city where the priests get the most money from milking people with the legend of Benares. The myth around Benares is, that I've said, you know, that if you die in Benares, you get liberated. Kabir said, this is a crock of shit. And the other legend was that if you die in a place called Magaha, which is 120 kilometers from Benares, you're reborn as a donkey. So nobody wanted to die in Magaha. <laughs> so when Kabir realized he was about to die, he told his disciples, his buddies, actually, they weren't disciples. They just adored him. And he said, OK, guys, we're going to Magaha. I'm going to die in Magaha just to detonate <laughs> this fantasy once and for all. <laughs> so he goes to Magaha, right? And he's in his hut dying in, in bliss. And what happens? A group of Hindu crazies turn up and claim him as a Hindu mystic. Mm -hmm. And a group of Muslim crazies turn up and claim him as a Muslim mystic, because by that time they realized that somebody had to claim him, because if they claimed him, their authority would go. And he just rolled his eyes and died. And one half of his body turned into golden flowers for the Hindus. And the other half of his body turned into red flowers for the Muslims, and a riot was averted. And I've been to the place where he died. Mm. I looked at his sandals, which are just a poor man's sandals. And there's a Muslim mosque, and then there's a Hindu temple, and they both claim him, but they love each other. And Kabir is smiling over the whole lunatic fringe. Mm. What happened after his death? is that Kabir became the most important poet to all the Sufi mystics and the Muslim mystics, mm. and the most important poet to all the Hindu mystics. And when the great gurus of Sikhism, and they were very great men, founded Sikhism, guess what? The first guru put 300 of Kabir's poems at the center of the Sikh scriptures. Mm. So he became the omnipresent, omni-illuminating, mystic poet of all of the religious traditions of India, the king, the ragged, yeah. blue-collar king, the best kind of king. My favorite kind of king. My um, favorite kind of king. This, and that's just the beginning about Kabir, but that gives you a flavor for mm -hmm. what kind of Fierce, gorgeous, truth-telling being he was and is. And why he's important to us now is this. Hmm. We've come to a time in our history when we're in a global dark night, which could very well threaten our extinction. But the great evolutionary mystics like Kabir knew this, knew that Kali Yuga was going to erupt. He talks about it in his poems, but knew also because he'd woken up to this next level of human evolution, that this global dark night could be the birth canal of a new kind of human being, purified by tragedy, forced by extreme crisis to go into a convulsion of transformation that would result in what I call engoldenment, the turning to gold of mind, heart, soul, and body, the creation of a human being utterly enreeled and so able to co-create with the divine a wholly new way of being and doing everything. 
And through Kabir, through working on Kabir for 10 years in isolation, I worked on Kabir silently, quietly in a, in a hut in Arkansas with my two cats. And he came to me. I'm not literally, I mean, I wouldn't have survived that, but he came in miracles and in, in presence in gorgeous dreams. Through it, I realized, oh my God, he has the key. He's the one who can bitch slap us into reality and then pour mm. into our bitch slap quivering selves the nectar, the golden burning honey of the real truth. And that we don't have to sign up to everything and or anything. We just have to do the practices humbly, work on our whole being with the grace pouring down. And terrible though the situation that we now find ourselves in, we will be able to recognize through the grace of the great evolutionary pioneers like Kabir that this is not the end potentially, mm. but the doorway into an unimaginably gorgeous new beginning. So that's why I love him. And that's why I've spent 10 years of my wild Kabirized life mm. on him. And I'm so thrilled <laughs> to be able to present to you all now this book in golden and 366 timeless poems a year with Kabir, because with this book, he will become your friend as he's become my friend. And I love him with my whole being. And I'm so grateful that I finally got it together in my 60s to dare to face the agony and ecstasy of trying to get him into English, because it's very difficult to be mm. too simple. But I, I had enough skill, I think, and enough realization just to be able to do some kind of justice to his stupendous transformation. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, let's, um, let me read, um, you asked me to pick five. That I felt... asked the master of enrealment to pick five from the king of enrealment oh, to, that would speak to him and to speak to you. So I didn't have to do all the talking. <laughs> so I'm gonna read from March 5th. Oh, March 5th. Page 73. Ooh. This is very timely for me in my current circumstances. Um, the truth's available, but there are no buyers. Uh. It's everywhere, but expensive. If you don't pay the price, you get no reward. You just keep wandering around illusion city. What did you say in seven lines, eight lines? What does that mean to you in terms of your life right now? What does it mean to you right now? Well, well, so right now, you know, in this situation that I'm in, I can recognize what truth is. You know, there's all kinds of noise around it. There's all kinds of ways in which systems coalesce to circle the center and distract you from that which you know. So I'm in that. Um, and the recognition of truth for me is not difficult. Um, I don't, I don't have any problem with it. It's, it's like a natural orientation um, and a, a a way of being as a matter of inquiry, personal right. and collective inquiry. Um, a nakedness, an authenticity of being. It's just, it's just uh, has always been um, organic um, and of course cultivated and deepened over right, time right. as a capacity for recognition of truth. My struggle has been because of this politicized situation that I'm in to express the truth in right. the most frightening of circumstances. Um, right. Now I was standing down abuse of power and speaking truth uh, in my crib. So I am familiar with the need to speak truth in the most frightening of circumstances, a little child with a overbearing mother and an overbearing father and nothing could seem more frightening. Um, and as I've gone through my life in my article year in criminal law, I, you know, there was this particular lawyer there who was trying to undermine me in all kinds of ways because he was felt threatened by me. Uh, and yeah. I spoke truth in that context and I risked losing my articles and I continue throughout my life to go to that I know this very specific edge right. where I feel, and I did it with writing grounded spirituality and going after the patriarchal spirituality. I know about this. Right. It's this place that's very uncomfortable, but yet I know that if I can cross that line, right. I start to feel like I've moved to the next developmental stage with respect right. to my own wholeness. 
Right. So right now, without going and into... this ordeal has risen as that challenge, hasn't it? So uh, I presume that it has, and yeah. I've resisted that, and I've repressed it for the most part for 14 months, and now it's coming to the surface, and it seems to be saying to me, uh, you know, the stakes are getting higher with respect yes. to your willingness to express truth yes. uh, and, and the risks associated with it. So what I understand is we live in a world, So, and, and in the heart of this, I look around at people I know, and I feel like one of the only brave ones in an ocean of cowards, really. Yes. And, I, and I think the distinction is a lot of those people recognize truth, but have no willingness to express it. Right. If there's a possibility that they will lose something as a result of if it. They have to sacrifice something for it. Yeah. And this is what he says. He says, if you don't pay the price, you get no reward. You just keep wandering around Illusion City, which is what 99% of people, even when they do recognize the truth of the multiple crises that we face, are doing because they simply haven't got the guts to risk anything. Well, yeah. and, and we've been manipulated as a yes. culture yes. and overstimulated, overwhelmed, and yes. dumbed down and undernourished so that even if we have a little chutzpah, to try to own the truth, we don't have the energy or the spaciousness or, or the, the wisdom or the state of integration in our fragmented state where we can come as a solid centered being to the world to speak the truth. Um, Absolutely. So there's a lot. So it's not just about personal choice. It's no, also it's a lot about, about social conditioning and the horrible depletion of our souls that's taken place in our culture. I mean, people are driving home, you know, they're in their trucks or in their cars, driving an hour and a half home from work oh, to yes. pay an overwhelming mortgage, mortgage, and then we expect them to realize and create space for the things you right. and I are talking right. about. So a lot of things have to change before right. people can not only see it, but can actually express it and to risk so everything true. in the heart of and it. That's um, beautifully and we need to have compassion for those circumstances yes. and we also also need to be able to figure out what to do about it right well we um, you don't need you need compassion but not idiot compassion no, because no. letting yep. people yep. rest in grounded compassion is actually yes absolutely. absolutely what's your second choice i love what you're saying what's your great. second choice great okay so i'm going to go to october 20th oh. um, because i like the way he linked truth to realness because that felt really <laughs> right for me it's a very okay. simple one October if, the 27th. October 20th, page 320. Aha. Oh, mm. uh -huh. If you're real. So I just want to stay there. Real. Like what the fuck is In real, real? man, yes. No, but what is real? I mean, let's really talk about that. Right. If you're real, curses can't reach you. Death can't gobble you. Striding from truth to truth. What could destroy you? And and I can read that in a very ungrounded way, like, you know, you'll never die if you're a truth speaker or something. Or I can read it in a very different way, which was that you will move through your life in this self healthily self-satisfied state of being, because on no level and no part of you no depthful part of you, no shallowed part of you, no part of you is oriented around falsehood. Right. Oh, I mean, and, and that landscape, the true experience of reality, reality is a whole being experience. Yes. That's the place where you can most deeply access the brilliance and the divinity of the human experience yes because totally when you're human when yes. you're that's it because so when you're there's a, a degree of fragmentation right and a fundamental falsity in the way that you're functioning you're not really here right right so that was always my my issue with the ungrounded spiritualities and the patriarchal but spiritualities. that's the whole issue you've tackled again and again in your work that's right. why right. you chose in real month right isn't it because real means yeah. it totally authentic in mind heart soul and body all together in the depths and the core of your human and therefore divine experience that's what right. is in your communication to us through your work and to me because i've often had these amazing conversations with you in which you've said andrew 
Don't you understand that just by being yourself completely, really, that's how you become real. It's not just through the mystical awakenings. It's through integrating what you discover at the deepest levels of you with everything that you are all the time. That's what Kabir means. Like, like not self-avoidant self-realization, right. real self-realization, which is right. an integrative process, a grounded embodied integrative process and is the real experience of engoldenment as far as i'm concerned right. where you don't need to transcend to have some glimpse no, from it's the... all here right now right. that's it yes that's it that's it beautiful can you read it one more time because it's such an astonishing point because i think the last two lines are really important in what you're going through too yeah if you're real curses can't reach you death can't gobble you striding I love that. Str yeah, that's str it. Striding from truth right. to truth. What could destroy you? But this is the point, isn't it? Mm. He's, he, not zigzagging, not itsy bitsying between truth and truth, not going to Jamaica to rest between truths, but striding, being in the deepest sense, a brave, concentrated human being, confident in the truth of what you know, and striding from truth to truth, with majesty, with dignity, with fierce compassion, with nobility. Mm. That's when you are indestructible. Even if they get you, they don't get you. Even if they get you, they don't they get don't. you. Yeah. Because there's a moment which comes in the lives of all really great heroic pioneers, and it's, comes in, it's come in mine, and I know it's come in yours. It came to me one day when I had a, had a series of death threats when I left my guru and bombs had been thrown through my window. And I said to my husband, my ex-husband, I said, look, I'll just say I, I'm lying and then all of this will stop. And he was dying of cancer at the time. And he said, if you do that, you're already dead. Yeah. If they kill you and me because they're crazy, they will never be able to kill our love and they will never be able to kill the stance that you've taken. In fact, it will water that stance with your blood. So you become a martyr and that will be perfect. It would be a great career move. So don't, don't give up any part of your truth. I did not fall in love with you because you were going to survive by lying. I fell in love with you because you tell the truth and I will die with you if necessary. But I will never let you lie, even if it's going to preserve our yeah. life. And that was a major education because it taught me one thing that is really become more and more real for me, which is that you cannot change anything that you're not prepared to die for. You Absolutely. cannot change right. Right. anything you're not prepared to die for. And I didn't, and you have to get to that point where you understand that even if they kill you, they can't kill you if you go forward striding from truth to sure. truth. You know, this lately in this context, this line kept coming through me. And the line was, um, I would rather die speaking truth about power than live like a coward before it. Uh, and I, and I, I, you know, I, and you would, I know that about you. I you, really, you really would. Yeah. I feel the temptation to retreat and to lie about what's happened, but I feel a stronger movement in the direction of truth speak. So let me read another one. Um, November 14th, page 348. This is a little different. I love the ones you've chosen. This is so tremendous. 348. Yes. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. You want to read it, Andrew? No, no, no. Okay. The one. I love the way you read. Actually, you're the ideal voice for Kabir because you've got much more of a butch voice than I do. Come on, then read it. Go on. <clears throat> Get my butch voice on. Um, the one has given a root of wisdom. The real one has given a root of wisdom. This root is precious to me, filled with sweet honey. In the Benares of the body, I love that line. In the Benares of the body, there's a huge house. In the middle of this house, there's a secret. 
a fierce and ruthless goddess who ate the whole universe saw the real one there and trembled with fear. I, I do that again. A fierce and ruthless goddess who ate the whole universe saw the real one there and trembled with fear. Taking refuge in truth, Kabir says, I crossed over singing with all those who believe me. The true soul pod, the ones who walk beside you, who stride beside you as you stride from truth to truth. Even with my sciatica, I am striding or hobbling beside you, my friend, as you take this journey. I know you are. But this is Thank the you. poem for our time. Mm. Because the fierce and ruthless goddess who ate the whole universe is the Kali force mm. that is now creating this vast apocalyptic dark night. Mm -hmm. But, 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 Kabir will guide you to your own house in which the real one lives. Mm. And the real one is eternal awareness, eternal truth, eternal deathless, grounded mm. reality. And when that destructive force faces that, it trembles with fear. Yes, so yeah. Kyle, his gift to us, Kabir, is the gift of the real that can make the dark goddess that is doing this destruction tremble with fear and initiate us into our own fearlessness in this terrible moment that could also turn out to be the moment of our liberation from all shackles. Amazing stuff. You know, the difference between Kabir and Rumi is also in the word that he uses in the last line. Kabir leads with truth. Rumi leads with love. Love, love. love is soaked in truth in Rumi's poetry, and truth is soaked in love in Kabir's poetry. But there is a difference. Yeah. Kabir never seeks to enchant you or seduce you or ladle you over with gorgeous imagery. Kabir grabs you by the neck, looks into your eyes and gives you the skinny without fear, nakedly, and then lets you deal with it because he treats you as a noble adult. This is so amazing and mm. so incredibly empowering. Mm. He doesn't always treat you as a noble adult. Some of his best poems begin with, wake up, you idiot, son of a whore. <laughs> now I've got your attention. <laughs> <laughs> He'll do anything. <laughs> but the real Kabir is saying, you're the child of God. Stop hiding. Stop pretending. You're not a weakling. Mm. You're not some itsy bitsy new age of snowflake. You are the adamantine child of the mm. beloved. Mm. Stand tall. Be you. Be real. Know that you are here for the most beautiful, holy, imaginable purpose to be born as your essential divine human in real self. And get on with it. Perfect. Perfect teaching, right? Absolutely. Page 380, December 14th. Oh, December the 14th, yeah. I thought this was just, I just like the way I felt when I read this. Um, I've been a yogi for far longer than anyone could begin to remember. <laughs> I don't come or go. I don't vanish. I enjoy the endless sound. I see my family all around me. Every place I go is a party. I'm in all. All are in me. In the many, I'm alone. Focused power, profound meditation. Silent, I speak. Outer form, inner form, no form. I play and dance within myself. Listen, friend, I have no agenda. In my hut, I sway to and fro in the self, and I play simply to please myself. Uh, simply to please myself. Yes. Because it's really subtle. He's not mm. a narcissist doing what he wants. He's not no, a hedonist. No. He is living the life of the noble, transcendent, immanent self. And whatever pleases that self, he is dedicated to doing at all moments. But it is essentially play because he's free. He's free from 
the fruits of his own action. He's given it all up to the one, and he's now the one playing in freedom in his ordinary, extraordinary life, treating everyone he meets as God and everywhere he meets as the site of a party. Isn't that stunning? That's liberation in a body. That's in real moon. Got it. Uh, yeah, it's fantastic. I'm so thrilled you chose that poem. It's one of his greatest poems, and it's mm -hmm. a comprehensive mystical education in itself. Yes, yeah. totally. Yeah. The whole thing's in it. It doesn't err on the side of an addiction to transcendence. It doesn't err on the side of narcissism and materialism. Right. It balances matter and light, individual life and eternal life the me that is personal and the me that is impersonal in a perfect, playful, grand, festive, endlessly energetic way. That's truth. Where the oceans of, where the oceans of essence meet the individual droplet of meaning. Exactly. August 7th, my last pullout, uh, page 241. I'm nobody and nothing, you know, and you know, nothing and nobody if you don't know me. My name isn't found in any religious directory. And even these words vanish as you listen, follow their vanishing. And I end our time by reading you the real ultimate poem of enrealment. I mean, the end of the journey of enrealment. We've, we've had so many hours of wonderful guy conversation about this in various places, you know, and I've learned so much from you. And I love the gutsiness that you've brought to everything that you've done. And I'm always saying to you, look, enrealment is a door into enrealment. The R becomes capital. And this is the poem of the R as capital. Okay. Because I believe that the work that you've done, which is so remarkable, is the foundation and the scaffolding of the house for the evolutionary quantum leap into divine humanity. And this poem is the poem of the moment when you realize, oh my God, I'm not just awake and I can't, I'm not just awake. I'm actually a hologram of the living one in heart, mind, soul, and body. And this is completely astounding. And I'm <laughs> never going to recover from this and I don't want to. And this is the poem of awakening, not just simply to enlightenment. He, enlightenment happened to him in his early twenties, but the enrealment process I think probably gathered strength and sometime in the middle of his thirties, he became totally one with the one in everything. And this is the moment. Conch, gong, trumpet. Hear them thrilling through the divine palace of your body. As at last, at long last, you merge with your eternal husband. Let love's mad joy surge through your whole being in wave after wave. This is what you were born for, and this is what you died to live. And what's astonishing about that poem is this. Mm -hmm. Conch gong trumpet is the way in which in a Hindu temple, the musicians of the temple announce the appearance of the God in the temple. And Kabir is saying that when you come to this stage through grace and through your sweat and through your passion and through dying into life, you will hear the music that announces the birth of a God in you as a hologram of God, as a living pulsing drop of the great ocean of light consciousness that is manifesting everything. This is your moment that you've been waiting for in incarnation after incarnation. Here it is. Conch, gong, trumpet, hear them, savor them, love this moment. 
thrilling through the divine palace of your body. Every other poet would be saying in your divine palace of your heart, mind, of your enlightened mind. <laughs> no, Kabir is saying it's going to happen in Jeff and in Jeff's body, in the cells, in his willy, in the depth of his groin, in the pairs of his thighs, in the bones of his legs, in his viscera. That's where the thrilling palace is. It's you and your big you coming together. As at last, at long last, you merge with your eternal husband. And one of the great things about Kabir is for all his incredible masculinity, he often writes as a woman because he knows that in a mystical sense, there's only one guy around and that's the eternal light. And we're all, as long as we are receptive and yearning and longing, we're, we're, it's the feminine in us that is yearning for that union. Masculine in us that is brave enough to continue it. But the greatest gift in the soul is that longing that, make, that feminizes us to be able to receive. So this moment is emerging as a wife, an ecstatic tantric wife with the eternal husband that you have longed to be one with always. So beautiful. And then let love's mad joy. It's not, I mean, it's crazy to be born as a God, as Jeff or Andrew, you know, with your cap and my, sciatica but it happens this is <laughs> it does happen this is one of god's great it's god's greatest magical trick let love's mad joy let it surge through your whole being the whole of you everything you are wave after wave it's orgasm in its ultimate state, the divine orgasm of the unification of your whole being in an real man. And then the last verse, this is what you were born for. This is what you were born for. And this is what you went through all the suffering and the ordeal and the madness and the pain and the betrayal and the abandonment and the hysteria of the path to die in, at last into eternal life, a life that will never be able to take, to be taken away from you when you become completely real. Because when you become completely real, you're one with the real, and the real was never born and will never die. And when Jeff with the cap and Andrew with the sciatica will vanish, we'll still be here because we've been born. And we'll be here as us, as the hologram that we are, just as Kabir is here with us right now, he isn't vanished into this sea. The sea has given him the power to be a drop of that sea, but with the whole sea speaking through it. He has this incredible poem. He says, you are just one wave of the ocean. But let me tell you something. In that one wave, the whole ocean Booms. And when you really, through grace, come to read Kabir, you'll find out that in all of the waves of each of his lines, the whole damn ocean of the divine is booming. And it's booming right now. And he'll never be anywhere but here teaching us all, if we dare to listen, how to get here now. And being here means being in all realms simultaneously in the body with your buddy with a cap on. Be real now. <laughs> right. In Golden Mint, Andrew's new and eternal book of Kabir poems. Thank you. It's available on Amazon for the price of a bad breakfast. I published it at 1499. Oh wow. So if you can hear this wild talk between two great soul friends and not do yourself the joy of having Kabir as your friend forever, there is nothing more I can do for you than what I've done <laughs> in spending three years going out of my mind to bring back from my out of my mindness these treasures for you at the moment when you really need them most. Please, 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 please get with the big kahuna.
You've done more than enough, Big Lion. More than enough. It's just beginning. I'm just getting my just wind. getting warmed up. I know. Yes. I feel that. And way. so are you. Look that. out, world. We're not. We will. We may be staggering and hobbling, but we'll be supporting each other, shoulder to shoulder. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. Merci.